When Hannah Clark was 19 years old, she met the love of her life, Rowan Baxter. But little did she know that the man she was madly in love with wasn't exactly who she thought. Even after she realized it, she tried to free herself, but Rowan did everything to stop her from leaving, even if it meant hurting their own children. Hannah was born on September 8, 1988, in Brisbane, Australia. She grew up surrounded by her parents, Sue and Lloyd, and her little brother, Nathaniel. Ever since she was a child, Hannah has always been a very dynamic and lively girl. She was very passionate about sports and was very good at gymnastics, especially trampoline gymnastics. She also won four titles at the trampoline championships, including a gold and a silver medal. After retiring, she became an elementary school teacher. In 2009, when she was only 19, she met Rowan Baxter, who was 11 years older than her. They met through Rowan's son, and at that time he presented himself as a single father even though he was still living with his wife. According to them, it was love at first sight. They shared a common passion for sports. Rowan, who was born in New Zealand, was also into sports. Moreover, he had been a professional rugby player before coming to Australia, and now he was a top sports coach. When Hannah introduced Rowan to her parents, her mother didn't like him. Beyond the fact that he was 10 years older than her daughter, she found him arrogant and the fact that he was living with his ex-wife did not reassure her either. But over time, Rowan managed to be accepted by Hannah's parents. He seemed to love and care about their daughter, he was always there for her, and was also very helpful to her parents. Seeing their daughter happy and in love dissipated their doubts. But what they didn't know was that, in reality, he was a completely different person. In 2011, he asked Hannah to marry him, and they got married in October 2012 in New South Wales. It was Rowan who took care of everything, the guest list, outfits for the bride and groom, the meals, and every other little detail. It was indeed a beautiful wedding and the beginning of a new life full of hope together. In the first couple of years, the couple seemed happy and they had three children, Aaliyah, Leanna, and Trey. Both of them were very passionate about nutrition and fitness, so they decided to open a gym in Brisbane together. They practiced there and gave classes to men and women, and even planned on giving lessons for children. Despite the success of their business, their relationship was getting strained. Rowan's behavior started changing, he became more and more controlling every day. At first there were little things, for example, he used to tell her how to dress, and he wouldn't let her wear pink, saying that pink is for children. Hannah was very social, she had a lot of friends and was also well known in the sports field. He didn't like that at all and started isolating Hannah from her old friends and relatives. But that was not enough for him, so he decided to distance her from her parents, despite the fact that they were very close. Sue and Lloyd had always supported Hannah, and when she told them about her and Rowan's plan to open a gym, they encouraged them and even loaned them money. But in order to feel indebted, Rowan found Hannah's parents intrusive and didn't want to see them at the gym. Moreover, he was the one who decided whether or not they could see their grandchildren. When he was mad with Hannah, he forbade his children from going to their grandparents, only to make her suffer. They used to fight a lot, and then she would call her mother in tears, feeling helpless. Her mother was aware that Hannah had changed and that every day Rowan had more and more influence over her. He was also a very jealous person. He didn't want Hannah to talk to their male customers. He would blame her and accuse her of flirting with them. In reality, she was only talking to them because of her job. But to avoid any argument with her husband, she started to withdraw herself from everyone. Rowan wouldn't let Hannah wear shorts to the gym. He also didn't allow her to go to the beach with her children without him. She could wear her bathing suit only on the beach and wasn't allowed to buy ice cream or get something from the car without covering herself up. Hannah did not complain. She thought that every married couple had these kinds of problems. But one of her best friends, Lou Farmer, worked with women who were victims of domestic violence, and she had noticed that something was wrong. She wasn't the only one at the gym who noticed Rowan's behavior toward Hannah. For example, he used to belittle Hannah, who gave birth to three children in a short period of time, telling her that she wasn't pretty and that she was a fat pig and needed to go on a diet and get her life together. One day, Lou had a discussion with Hannah. She brought up Rowan's abusive and controlling behavior and told her that it looked like domestic violence. But Hannah did not agree with her, telling her that Rowan only had a bad temper but had never beaten her. Hannah lived in constant fear of provoking an argument or doing something that was considered reprehensible by her husband. Rowan also had a big sexual appetite, and he demanded intercourse every night without exception. He could also be very violent during the act. If Hannah refused to do anything, he would take revenge on their children. He would get very angry for no reason, beat the children, and even take their toys. Rowan was not a good father, he considered his children as objects and his property, and he wanted to have total control over them just like he had control over their mother. He wanted to raise them the hard way. One day he put their son Trey in an ice bath, held him, and didn't just dip his toes, he held him right up to his neck, and the poor kid was frantic. His eyes were bulging in fear. He posted on social media videos of his children and thought they were funny. Other times, he would tackle Aaliyah with almost full force into a blow-up pool, and the girl was seen crying at the end of the video. Gradually, Rowan became more and more paranoid. 
He assumed that Hannah had a lover and that she would send the children to their grandparents and meet with him. Of course, all of that was something that he made up. Hannah lived in fear. She even had the impression that Rowan was aware of conversations that she could have in private with her parents or with her friends. His jealousy got worse every day, so one day he decided that they didn't need two Facebook accounts, so he created a single one for both of them. At the end of 2019, the situation became unbearable for Hannah. She couldn't take it anymore. The discussion with her friend Lou had made its way into her mind. Now she had realized that her husband's behavior was not normal and that it corresponded perfectly to what is called coercive control. Hannah finally opened her eyes and saw that this man had nothing to do with the man she had fallen in love with. Therefore, she decided to keep a little distance at first, saying that she needed a little break and not mentioning anything about divorce. But, of course, Rowan refused. Furthermore, he managed to convince her to stay, telling her that they are a family and that there are ups and downs between couples, which are completely normal. He also manipulated her by mentioning the children, saying that they should stay together for their children's sake. So Hannah decided to stay. Life resumed its course, but unfortunately nothing changed. In December of the same year, Hannah once again decided to leave. One day while he was at work, she packed some things for herself and her children and left. She stopped by a local McDonald's and left her car with her phone there. She suspected that he had placed spyware on her phone because he often knew about conversations she had had in his absence with her relatives. After that, she went to a friend's house to plan the rest. She stayed there for a few days, then she went to her parents where she felt safer. Hannah was very scared because she knew things would not be easy, but she was somehow relieved to have made this decision. All of her friends were there for her despite the fact that she had distanced herself from them the last few years and for that she was very grateful. As expected, Rowan didn't take this well at all. Now he was threatening to take the children from her. Thus, she decided to go to the police to explain what was happening, but unfortunately, she did not have any concrete evidence except her words, which weren't enough to obtain a protection order. On December 26, 2019, the day after Christmas, he convinced her to meet him at the park so he could see the children. They also spent the afternoon together. Everything was going well until Hannah decided to leave. She was returning to her car with her children, and Rowan offered to help. Hannah had Trey on her hip, Aaliyah was holding her hand and the skateboard, and Rowan was holding Leanna. They got to the middle of the street, and he asked if he could have the children for the night, and Hannah refused. So he took off across the street with Leanna and ran to the car. He drove off while Hannah and her two children were still in shock and unable to do anything as they watched the car drive away. A witness who saw everything immediately called the police. Unfortunately, they couldn't do anything because there was no restraining order preventing Rowan from leaving with his daughter. Rowan then gave his version of the story, saying that their daughter came with him willingly and Hannah was a liar. He didn't give Leanna back for three days. Later, following this incident, Hannah finally managed to obtain a restraining order, thus ending this terrible year with relief. She thought that the worst days were over and that she was finally going to be able to start over with her life with her children. But for an unknown reason at the beginning of January, the restrictive order was modified, giving Rowan full access to the children. Meaning that he could now take his children whenever he wanted. He only had to keep his distance from Hannah. Rowan had only one thing in mind, to make Hannah suffer for leaving him. On the evening of January 30th, he brought the children back to their grandparents. Hannah went out to take the children from the car when she noticed that Rowan had printed a whole bunch of photos of her in her underwear on a four sheets and lined the entire cabin with them, as well as the windows of his car. He threatened her, saying that he was going to publish them and that everyone would know that she was a sex maniac. Hannah immediately tried to snatch all the photos, but Rowan violently twisted her arm and tried to break it. Following this new incident, he was accused of having violated the restraining order and now he no longer had access to the children. However, he continued to post pictures of his children on social media, portraying himself as a devastated father who couldn't see them because of their selfish mother and that he was missing them. There were a lot of people who supported him, advising him to stay strong and keep his head up. In addition, he wrote Hannah a long email in which he accused her of destroying their family and for being a terrible mother. He also blamed her for the gym, which she also left and Rowan didn't take care of either because he was too busy trying to get her back. In conclusion, he kept Hannah responsible for the whole situation. On February 10, 2020, while she was at home, she turned to her mother and asked her if she should make a will. Her mother was surprised by the question because Hannah was quite young and had no health problems. She asked her mother to take care of the children in case something happened to her. She was constantly afraid that Rowan would hurt her and send her to prison. But her mother reassured her that everything was going to be okay and that soon she would get divorced and things would get better. Unfortunately, she did not know what was going to happen to her daughter a few days later. While there was the restraining order, Rowan broke into Hannah's house and demanded to see her phone, but then noticed that she had a new phone and wanted an explanation. Indeed, she changed her phone because, for a while now, she had been suspicious that he had placed a tracker on her cell phone, even though she could never really prove it. Maybe because of that, he was always aware of her conversations with other people and he always knew where she was. 
On February 18, 2020, Rowan FaceTimed with his children, and during the FaceTime, he cried uncontrollably. Hannah was touched by him, despite the fact that he made her life a living hell. Nevertheless, she thought that he might have missed the children, and she even felt guilty. However, what she didn't know was that he wasn't crying for that, but because he knew what he was going to do the next day. On February 19, 2020, Rowan went to a gas station, where he filled a jerry can with gasoline. He also borrowed the car from his aunt, claiming that he had a long way to go and that his car wouldn't hold up. But, in fact, he wanted to cover his tracks and go unnoticed. That day, like every morning, Hannah woke up, went to the cafe to get her favorite coffee around 6 a.m., and went back home to get her children to school. Once everyone was ready, they got in the car and left for school. Hannah hadn't noticed Rowan, who was hiding in his aunt's car, watching them and waiting for a good moment to take action. As soon as she left, he started following her, and when he caught the right moment, he got out of his car, jumped in the front seat with Hannah, and put a knife to her throat, ordering her to drive. She had no choice but to follow his orders. She was so scared and suspected that Rowan could hurt her, but she had never thought that he could also hurt their children. Without hesitation, Rowan began dousing his family in gasoline. Hannah then spotted a man with a hose in the distance and shouted from the car, Call the police, call the police, he's trying to kill me. He's put petrol on me. Unfortunately, the man didn't have time to understand what was going on because Rowan lit the car on fire, opened the door, and got out. Hannah also managed to get outside of the car, but she was now transformed into a human torch. The man who witnessed the crime scene desperately tried to extinguish the fire with his garden hose. Another witness ran towards the flames with a fire extinguisher, but Rowan had not finished yet and didn't allow her. It was a horrifying scene. Hannah was standing still and conscious, her skin falling off in tatters, and she raised her arms to the sky, shouting, My children are in the car, save my children. Even if there were a lot of witnesses who wanted to help, Rowan wouldn't let anyone near the car, and unfortunately, it was too late. He was also burned by the flames, and when he had nothing left to do, he stabbed himself in the chest and died. Ambulances and more than 30 police officers intervened on the tragic scene. When they arrived, Hannah was burned 97% but was still conscious and didn't know that Rowan was dead. She refused to take sedation and found the strength to tell the police that Rowan had poured gasoline on her and her children and set them on fire. It was after her declaration that she lost consciousness. Then she was sent to the hospital, where she was plunged into a coma, but unfortunately, her injuries were too serious, so she couldn't survive and died after three days. Hannah and her three children's funeral took place on March 9, 2020, where their four bodies were placed in the same coffin. A lot of people attended their funeral, even Prime Minister Scott Morrison and Queensland Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk were among the mourners at the Brisbane service. Hannah's parents, Sue and Lloyd, have since become outspoken advocates against domestic violence and established the Small Steps for Hannah Foundation in their daughter's honor. Mrs. Clark hoped for more understanding and awareness about family violence, including through advertisements and educational campaigns. Hannah's father, Lloyd, said outside court that he hoped the inquest would determine how the system let his daughter and grandchildren down, so they can put new procedures in place, so people won't have to go through this terrible thing him. In my opinion, the system failed Hannah and her children. They failed to protect them and prevent their deaths. The police knew about her husband and what he had done to her, but they didn't act. When Hannah's friend talked to them about her concerns that Rowan might do something to Hannah, they said that they can't help until he does something, even though she told them that they might not have a second chance. Like in Hannah's case, they often are not given a second chance to protect women. It shouldn't be accepted as inevitable that one woman in Australia is killed every nine days by a current or former partner. Violence against women is preventable. Rowan's actions reaffirm the well-evidenced fact that men who commit intimate partner femicide rarely do so out of the blue. Rowan Baxter had a history of violence. The inquest findings document how, in the period prior to his final act, Rowan had been the subject of a domestic violence order application, had breached the conditions of a domestic violence order, an act for which he was not charged, and had been the subject of an assault complaint. Furthermore, the inquest showed Hannah had been in contact with police and had expressed her concerns to family and friends. In Australia, the state has integrated specialist teams that take on high-risk domestic violence cases, but it is unclear whether Hannah was treated as a high-risk victim. All this exposed a system not built to effectively deal with men's violence against women or to contextualize every system interaction in a broader pattern in order to reveal the real risk to women and children. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to follow for more crime stories.